Grace Church. It's good to be with you again this Sunday morning and spend time in God's Word. But before we do, uh, by now I think many of us have heard that this quarantine is going to extend for many more weeks. And uh, our hearts are saddened by that, but we are challenged to remain faithful and uh, to continue to be here for you and uh, for one another as the church. One of the questions that's been asked of me is why do you continue in the series, Yeshua, Messiah, King, when people are struggling with different things during this quarantine? And my answer is twofold. First of all, our midweek videos that Phil and Nate and now uh, Tracy and Billy, Kathy, um, perhaps even others will be producing, will be addressing some of those specific needs that are being created by uh, the quarantine. So we do want to address and be helpful uh, to provide spiritual and biblical guidance during this time. My second response is that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And the foundation of the, tr of the church is, are the scriptures. And at the heart of the scriptures, as we know, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is important that the local church continue to teach the word of God in its full counsel, in its context, so that the church, that being us, the people of the church, continue in steady spiritual growth. And that the best way to do that is to continue to teach God's word in an expository way, in context, over the long term. And so that would be my answer as to why we're continuing in the Yeshua Messiah King series. Now I invite you to turn your Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 9, where we will be de, uh, studying out a familiar passage uh, to many of us called the Transfiguration. Uh, all of us experience pain in life. Much of the pain that we experience is not something that we seek. It is brought about through illness, it's brought about through physical accidents, it's brought about through difficulties in our relationships, um, even in you know, our, our, our upbringing and so on and so forth. But there are types of pain that we do choose. And when we choose to experience and endure that pain, it's because we believe that a good outcome, an outcome that we desire, will be accomplished uh, through experiencing that pain. A, a real simple one would be athletics. And so if you've ever played athletics, you know that the workouts are really hard and they're very painful, but we engage and we choose that kind of suffering and that kind of pain because we believe that uh, the playing of the sport, the competition, uh, with the hope of winning are, are all worth the pain that that requires. When we go into the dentist and we submit ourselves to that massive big old syringe that he jams or she jams into our jaw, uh, we endure that pain because we believe taking care of that cavity today uh, will result in avoiding the toothache tomorrow. And so uh, I don't mean to trivialize this uh, because as we're studying in context, the disciples are faced at this point in their relationship with Jesus, they are faced with the decision of following Jesus into the suffering that he is now revealing lays before him, even suffering unto death. Now, this is taking place after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's a, a critical point in uh, Jesus' ministry because with that definite conviction conveyed by Peter, and he seems to be representing 
the rest of the disciples, now Jesus begins to reveal more clearly what lays ahead in fulfilling God's program for salvation for the, and the establishment of the church. And Jesus has, after Peter's confession, he has begun to reveal to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, there suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, be killed, and rise again on the third day. And as we studied, Peter had a, a very negative response to that. Jesus rebuked Peter, and then he turned to all of the disciples and challenged them as to whether or not they were going to follow him into this suffering even if it included death. Now we read in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now Jesus also gave to the disciples a promise that if they do follow him, they will be rewarded for uh, following him. And then he closed this challenge off with a prediction, with a prophecy. And we see that in verses 27 and 28 of Matthew 16. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There's the prediction. There's the prophecy. Now, this prophecy was fulfilled about a week later in the event we call the Transfiguration. In all three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the prophecy, that is, that some standing there will not see death, they will not die before they see Jesus coming in the glory of his kingdom, they always put that prophecy followed by the transfiguration. An observation at this point, and that is that Jesus knew this event was going to take place and where it was going to take place. And I find that very interesting. And I believe that the transfiguration in large part occurred for the sake of the disciples as they found themselves with this challenge and decision that they needed to make concerning continuing to follow Jesus even unto death. Now the transfiguration took place on Mount Hermon. Now, Mount Hermon is the, the tallest mountain in Israel at 9,200 feet elevation. Jesus and his disciples have already been some time in uh, Caesarea Philippi, which is at the base of, of the southern end of Mount Hermon. About a week after the challenge as to whether they are going to follow him or not, Jesus chose Peter, John, and James to hike with him up to one of the peaks on Mount Hermon. We pick up the story in Luke chapter 9, in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, that is the challenge to follow him, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Now, as this scene unfolds, I think it's, I think they have hiked during one day to the peak or to one of the peaks on Mount Hermon. They have slept and 
the disciples are exhausted and they continue to sleep as Jesus gets up and steps away to pray as was his manner. And we pick up in verse uh, 29. And as he was praying, the disciples are sleeping. This is early morning. And as Jesus was praying, verse 29, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothes, clothing became dazzling white. Now Matthew says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Mark says, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. But what we need to understand is that this light was emanating from Jesus. It, so to speak, was coming out of Jesus. It was not Jesus reflecting a light. Jesus was the light. And this light is described as the brightness of the sun. And what this is, is the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, incarnated in a human body. And by, by that incarnation, his Shekinah glory that he possesses as deity, as God, was veiled, but on this moment, it was unveiled. And, and so what was revealed is, is this glorious Shekinah light shining out from Jesus, expressing his essence, who he is as the God-man. And... This light is so bright, it, it, it is, we could not, without God making it possible, we could not endure uh, living in the presence of this light. The scriptures in describing God himself says that God dwells in unapproachable light, a light that would destroy us. And there's, so this is a sense of Jesus in this time, like flashing his Shekinah glory. And for his time on earth, that Shekinah glory was veiled by his physical body. And it will be veiled again after the transfiguration. It's only when he is ascended that his Shekinah glory is unveiled forever. And so the next time, next time we see Jesus, we will see him in his Shekinah glory when he comes in his kingdom. It's, I, I think it's beyond the capacity of, of human language to describe the Shekinah glory uh, that Jesus shone on, on this morning of, of transfiguration. Not only did this happen, not only was his Shekinah glory revealed on Mount Hermon, but Jesus was joined by Moses and Elijah. And we pick up the story again in Luke chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. Luke 9, 30 and 31, where we read, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So Jesus is joined by Moses and Elijah. And the scriptures don't tell us why he was joined by these particular two, but in the Jewish mind, Moses uh, represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And the Messiah is revealed in both the law and the prophets. So it may be for that reason that these two appeared to Jesus. An interesting thing to think about, it says that both of them appeared in glory, but there was a difference because Moses died before entering the promised land, and therefore when he appears here, he has to have appeared as a glorified soul because as an Old Testament saint, 
He has not yet been bodily resurrected from the dead. He is awaiting the resurrection of Old Testament saints that will occur between the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the Messianic kingdom. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 12 in the final verses there. And so Moses is there uh, as a glorified soul. Elijah, on the other hand, never physically died. He was caught up to heaven by a whirlwind. And therefore, he had to have been translated. His, his body had to have been changed from mortality to immortality. And there then he is, a, he is appearing as a glorified body and soul. He is appearing in the form of those saints, those church age saints, who are alive at the time of the rapture and will not have to physically die, but they, their bodies will be translated in the twinkling of an eye to their resurrection bodies. That's Elijah. So it's interesting to, to think about that Moses and Elijah definitely are powerful evidence for the afterlife, and they're also powerful evidence of a glorified soul of those saints who are waiting to be resurrected, such as the Old Testament saints, and then Elijah representing those saints who have been translated, as many in the church will be translated at the rapture. Luke also tells us that uh, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah uh, talked about Jesus' departure which Jesus himself had begun to talk to his disciples about, that he must go to Jerusalem and there suffer many things at the hand of the religious leaders, be killed, and then rise on the third day. And so it's interesting that Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking about his departure. And in Luke, the term departure is the Greek word exodus. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the term used for the deliverance of the people of, of Israel from slavery in Egypt is Exodus. It's the same word that's used in the Greek translation. And so uh, I think there's an intentionality on the part of the biblical author that when Jesus goes to Jerusalem and suffers what he does, is killed and then is resurrected, then just as Moses liberated the nation of Israel from slavery, Jesus himself will be liberated from the limitations of his humanity, the veiling of his glory, but he then will also liberate all those who believe in him from sin and death. Now, what, what's interesting here is during all of this, Jesus' transfiguration, Moses and Elijah and their discussion, for most all of that, the disciples were asleep. The disciples were asleep. They almost slept through all of this. But the scriptures tell us that they did wake up and, <laughs> I mean, they just... They had to have been uh, surprised, you know, just out of their, out of their wits. We pick up the story in Luke chapter nine, verse thirty-two. Luke nine thirty-two. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus. Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Now, Peter's suggestion uh, may not be as bizarre as it sounds. A few weeks back, we studied the seven feasts of the Lord. Well, the seventh feast, the final feast of the Lord, is called the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was celebrated by 
pilgrims and worshipers coming to Jerusalem, building temporary shelters, which were called booths or tabernacles or temporary shelters. And they lived in those temporary shelters for a week, commemorating the wilderness wanderings and then the ultimate entry into the promised land. And Peter connects the Feast of Tabernacles with the beginning of the Messianic Kingdom, and he was right to do so. Because in Zechariah chapter 14, the connection is made between the Messianic Kingdom and the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. In Zechariah, what is revealed is that all of the Gentiles who, serve, who survived the tribulation will the families of the various nations that survive the tribulations will come up annually to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the, the coming of the Messianic Kingdom is connected by the prophet Zechariah to the Feast of Tabernacles. And it seems that Peter, in this moment of surprise, the Matthew and Mark also said they were gripped with fear. But this is what came to Peter's mind. He was thinking, oh, this is the beginning of the Messianic kingdom. The kingdom has begun. I mean, listen, Jesus is shining in, in sun-like glory. And here's Moses and Elijah, who are certainly going to be part of the Messianic kingdom. Peter associating the Messianic kingdom with the Feast of Tabernacles was correct, but his timing was off. His timing was incorrect because before the Feast of Tabernacles will be celebrated, the Feast of Passover, the death of the Lamb, that feast must be fulfilled. And that's what Jesus has been talking about, and that is what the disciples struggled to understand the necessity of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish God's plan of salvation. And so we read in Luke 9, 34, as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the, crowd, the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one, Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So Peter, James, and John experienced, in addition to all this that they have, they experienced what in Hebrew is called the bat kol. The bat kol. The bat kol is the heavenly voice. And we know that that heavenly voice comes from God the Father. The bat kol spoke at Jesus' baptism, as you recall, and said, Behold, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And here on this occasion, the bat kol, the heavenly voice, the, the voice of God the Father, says almost the exact same thing, but adds, Listen to him. And I think what God the Heavenly Father is emphasizing to Peter, James, and John is just as you have listened to the law and the prophets, so now listen to Jesus, the Messiah. Listen to what he's telling you. Accept what he is telling you. Follow him where he leads you. And this brings then to a close this experience in the lives of Jesus, Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah, the experience of the transfiguration. And I think there are several important truths that come from the transfiguration. First, the transfiguration clearly was another authentication that Jesus is the Messiah, the bat kol, the heavenly voice, God the Father, again, bearing testimony that Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Messiah, is the Son of God, is the one to whom we are to listen. 
And so the transfiguration brings that home again. This is yet another authentication that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the Son of the living God whom we should follow. <coughs> Excuse me. Second, the transfiguration was a preview of Jesus coming in his glory to establish his kingdom. Now, he didn't establish his kingdom at this time. He didn't say he would. But the disciples definitely experienced a preview of when Jesus does come at his second coming in his Shekinah glory unveiled to establish his kingdom and reign and rule on the earth. Now, this was a takeaway for Peter, who many years later wrote two letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, to Messianic Jews who had been spread throughout the Roman Empire by persecution. And in his second letter, Peter uh, makes reference to the transfiguration beginning in verse 16 of chapter 1. Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, that's the bot kol, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him, that's the voice that Peter, James, and John heard on Mount Hermon at the Transfiguration. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And so Peter is saying, when we talk to you about Jesus, and we talk to you about his second coming, and we talk to you about the things that are prophesied, we're not going off of just cl clever myths and you know people's imaginations and so on. We're sharing this with you from eyewitness experience, seeing and hearing. God confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah, and if he's the Messiah, then he's the one who's going to fulfill the prophecies written about the Messiah in the Old Testament. And so the transfiguration is a preview of the fulfillment of those prophecies concerning the Messianic kingdom. Jesus will come in his glory and he will reign and rule on the earth, just as it's pro prophesied in the Old Testament. The third significant uh, significance of the the uh, transfiguration is, is what I went into, and that is that it's a guarantee of the fulfillment of all prophecy. Moses, standing for the law, uh, the law prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Elijah, representing all the prophets. The prophets cer certainly prophesied the coming of Messiah and the kingdom. And uh, again, this was another major takeaway from Peter, because as he continues in his letter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, P Peter wrote, And we have the prophetic word, we have the prophetic word, prophecies in Scripture, more fully confirmed. I mean, we have a basis for a, 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 a complete, absolute confidence in the fulfillment of these prophecies to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The prophecies are what help us to have a clear vision of what's going to happen in the future, where history is going. It isn't that interesting during the time of this pandemic and just some of the interesting things taking place, but it's the prophecies um, concerning the rapture of the church and and uh, the purification of, of the church and the tribulation period and the millennial kingdom. And it's these prophecies that keep us steady and keep us confident, knowing where things are going. Things are not out of control. Just as God has fulfilled prophecy in the past, 
Just as he affirmed that Jesus is the Messiah, so God is in control, and as he has revealed the future, we can be confident, and that future gives us a light. It's like being in a, in a cave, going deeper into a cavern, where you have a flashlight, a powerful light that shows you the way. Now, people who don't know God and don't know the scriptures, they have no idea what the future holds. And as a result of that, their lives are full of anxiety. But we, following the Lord Jesus Christ, know where things are going. And that's what Peter is affirming here and encouraging his suffering Messianic believers to continue to be people who study the prophecies of the future and from that gain confidence and stability and peace and joy and hope and purpose. Again, he says that we pay attention to this prophecy as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. That is for us until the, res until the rapture and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The fourth, I think, significant thing that comes from the transfer transfiguration is that it's a clear pledge of life beyond the grave because here is Moses and Elijah with the Lord Jesus. Moses representing the saints that are awaiting the resurrection, Elijah representing uh, the saints who will experience translation such as those church age saints who will be translated if they are alive at the time of the rapture. They will not have to go through physical death. They will be translated in their bodies will be transformed from mortal to immortal. Uh, and so both Elijah and Moses are a pledge that there is life beyond the grave. Fifth, the transfiguration is really a testimony of the love and humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's conveyed beautifully in Philippians chapter 2 in the, in the what we call the kenosis, the the emptying of the Lord Jesus Christ to do the will of the Father, that he emptied himself. And in this situation, when he took on our humanity, he also knew that he was stepping away from his glory, that his Shekinah glory would be veiled. And as a result, he would be treated horribly by his own creation, mankind. Uh, but he was willing to do that, and so he veiled his glory in his incarnation as a baby, uh, revealed his glory for this moment in the transfiguration, but then again veiled it once again until the ascension. And so this really speaks of his humility, uh, leaving his glory, uh, having his glory veiled in this way. And it speaks of his love for the Father, because first and foremost he did it in submission to the will of the Father to provide salvation for mankind. And then secondly, it speaks of his great love for us and his great humility that he would be willing to empty himself uh, and to veil, you know, his Shekinah glory. Sixth, I think the transfiguration was also meant to infuse Peter, James, and John with faith and with courage to answer Jesus's challenge and to make the decision to follow him in to the suffering that lay ahead even even unto death and I think then the transfiguration in a very powerful way for Peter James and John and interestingly Peter, we already know, will play a very important role as we studied a few weeks ago. James will become the head of the Jerusalem church. He too will play a critical role. John will play a critical role in that he will, he will write large portions of the New Testament in the Gospel of John, in his three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and in the book of Revelation. 
these men will play a significant role in the establishment of the church. And I think the transfiguration was yet another experience that answered for them the question, as we all ask when we're facing suffering, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And their answer was a resounding yes. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are humbled when we read of the transfiguration and realize we can't begin to fully comprehend your glory. The glory as the second person of the Trinity, fully God, uncreated, the creator of all things. And we do thank you for your humbling yourself, your veiling of your glory that you would become a man and you would suffer and die and rise again, that we might be restored to a living, eternal relationship with God, being forgiven of our sin because of your blood sacrifice. Lord Jesus, uh, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that the transfiguration would fill our imaginations and would, like the disciples, answer for us the question, is it worth suffering and dying for you as your followers? And that we, like Peter, James, and John, would answer, yes, yes, you are the Messiah. Who else would we follow? Who else would we live for? But you. We love you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we offer this prayer. Amen. Well, Grace Church, thank you for being with us uh, today. Know that we continue to pray for you. We're here for you. Please don't hesitate to call if there's some way that we can be of help to you. Uh, and we love you very much. The Lord bless you as you continue to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.